get started, um, I just have a couple of quick announcements. Um, all exciting things. No, I haven't grown the church again in the same way. So, <laughs> But there are others who have caught on, so they're getting it. Um, but uh, I, the big thing, brothers and sisters, I want to chat with you about is just uh, some of you are aware that a few weeks ago, uh, we came up here and Coach John announced that he was sensing the new next step in his calling to, to kind of retire. And, and so this is something that Coach John, myself, and the elder team have actually been thinking about for months now. Um, and as Coach has just kind of waited for me, and I've been waiting for Coach. And, and so all this to say we've been praying about this. And uh, as we prayed about as an elder team and uh, as I talk with Coach, we both are feeling perhaps a sense of leading to an internal candidate here. Uh, for a part-time children's director. And so the reason I bring that out with you is for the next three weeks, uh, I want to be asking you to be praying uh, for discernment for ourselves as an elder team, for discernment for the person, uh, and uh, we'll kind of update you as the Lord leads us. But it's exciting. Be excited about it, and uh, we would covet your prayers. Uh, The second quick thing is just uh, I just want to thank you all for just uh, your grace to me and my family. Uh, You know, I'm part of a... Uh, senior pastors cohort in our at our association and uh, i talk with pastors all over the northwest and, and some of them are are in challenging churches uh, with members who are purposely trying to undercut some of the things they're doing uh, that are making threats to their family uh, and i know we're all sinners but i haven't had a personal family threat from you all uh, and so i just we're doing good right we're doing and so maybe we're one of the revelation churches but not that one um, but I just want to thank you again for just your grace and your and your kindness. So, uh, go ahead. Thanks, Tyler. Uh, well, did you all see uh, this past week? Uh, country music star uh, Toby Keith passed away on February sixth of uh, cancer. Uh, some of you are aware of that. Uh, I'm not much of a country man myself, but uh, you know I, I know the man's name, and I didn't follow country music, but he was quite successful. And uh, I got a chance to do a YouTube, watch a YouTube video of an interview uh, that he had stomach cancer and they had tried so many things and it just wasn't working. So they had talked with him kind of with the, with the last few days. And one of the things he, the interviewer asked them is he said, you know, like, how, how do you maneuver through these dark hallways? Because he said, you know, cancer's tough. You know, it's like you're not really sure what's going to happen. It might come into remission, and then you got scans later. And so he was saying it just never goes away. And, and one of the things Toby Keith th- said is he said, you know, it's faith. And he said, thank God I got it too. He said, you know, you take the faith for granted when things are good, and you lean on it when things are bad. And he said, this experience has taught me to lean on it more every day. And, and the interviewer said, well, have you experienced a peace that surpasses all understanding. I think about Philippians 4. And he says, you know, absolutely. He said, I finally got to the point in the spring where I was diagnosed on October 21, going through the chemo and the radiation, first time uh, kind of through this all. And he said, I got to the point where I was okay with whatever happened. He said, I had my brain wrapped around it, and I was in a good spot either way. And he said, people with faith just don't have that. And in that response, there seemed to be a joy a settled kind of acceptance and a confidence that whatever God had, it was going to be okay. And as you know, on February 6th, he passed away, and I don't know the sum of his faith in Christ, but I do know that as a result of what happened, he changed and began to understand the joy and the power of faith in trials. And the truth of the matter, brothers and sisters, is God wants all of us to have that same response. The truth is God really wants you to enjoy your life. He really wants you to have joy. Uh, But the problem is, is we too often choose frustration, anger, and other things because of our inability to live God's way. When we go our way, our lives end up resembling more Jonah than Toby Keith. It's crazy to think I'm comparing a country singer with a biblical character, but if there's any good comparison, it's him. Take your Bible with you and open it to Jonah chapter 4. And I want to talk to you today just a little bit uh, at the end of Jonah, as Pastor Kevin had mentioned to us, is that we're, we're in the final kind of section. And uh, we're going to look at something here, how Jonah finishes. And already at the outset, I'm going to do what Miss Teitelbaum, my 11th grade teacher, told me. She said, Eric, 
I've told you this. You need to tell them what you're going to tell them. Then you tell them. And then you tell them what you told them. And so in homage to my 11th grade teacher, that's what I'm going to do. And so this is what I want to tell you today. Is that God wants you to enjoy life by following his priorities. That is the truth of the scripture. Is that God really wants you to have joy in your life. And it's found by following his priorities. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to look at three points, and I will keep them up more than a second, I promise. Uh, and, but, and so I want to go through those and really just go through what this has to teach us. For those of you who are new here, maybe you're not a Christian or grateful you're here, you get a chance to kind of lean into uh, this, isn't, this is more of a message for people of faith and how they're to live. Uh, we'll talk to you more about what it looks like to come to Christ, but you have a chance to kind of well, lean in to see what God expects of people like myself and all of us who call ourselves Christians this morning. So we're always thankful you're here. Uh, let's ju- let's jump in. So the first thing I-, I want you to see as we just look at Jonah is that uh, Jonah's thought, the enemy to his joy, was Nineveh and God. Let's take a look at this. Uh, We're in verse 5, as was read to us. This is after Nineveh had gotten saved. And now Jonah responds and he says in verse 5, Jonah had gone out and sat down at the place east of the city. There he made himself a shelter and sat in its shade and waited to see what would happen to the city. This is pretty bad. I mean, he, he comes and sits on the east of the city and he thinks, you know, maybe God will listen to wisdom. Maybe God will be reasonable and uh, follow the truth. And, you know, he's already complained and he's thinking, let me just see if God knows what he's doing. And let me give God a second chance to see if he'll change his mind. And so that's what God, Jonah does. He sets up and he's got a drink with a small umbrella in his hand. And he says, what's going to happen? Let's see if God will finally do what he's supposed to do. And what do we see? But then in verse 6, the Lord God provides a leafy plant, uh, makes it grow. Uh, Jonah gives shade over it. And for those of you who love uh, the kind of culture and stuff, uh, what you're going to see is first and foremost is the greatest enemy to joy is not other people but yourself. I'll get back to that. Don't worry. But that right there is the kind of plant that Jonah had. It's called a castor oil plant in the Middle East. You can see how massive it is and how small the man's hand is. This was the kind of plant that was used for Jonah to provide him shade. And so that's what Jonah does. Is he And he gets happy about the plant, doesn't it? It says he gets very happy. Uh, if you ever watch the Super Bowl, if you will tune into it, I'm certain at some point you'll see someone say, let's go. You know, and it's just an exuberance of their excitement. That's the kind of joy Jonah had. He was juiced about the plan. It came over, he said, let's go. And yet he cared nothing about Nineveh. Uh, But he was excited about it and juiced, which is a sad, uh, it's a sad setup for what God does next. It says, but at dawn the next day, God provided a little worm, chewed it. And when the sun rose, God provided a scorching east wind. This is called a Sirocco. These are uh, windstorms in the Middle East that suck all the moisture out of the air, and the temperature rises about 16 degrees. I know some of you from the Northwest are sweating. Don't worry. It's going to stay in the 50s today, but you probably like Jonah. Uh, If you're baking in the sun, and all of a sudden, you have this storm that comes out of the air, sucks all the moisture, and raises the temperature up. And so Jonah sits here in verse 8 and just is beside himself. And you, th- you see, he's actually upset and thinks that the joy, the kill joy is God. And, and, the kill, and he's excited about the plant. But ultimately, what he needs to see and what we need to see is that the first point is that the greatest enemy to joy is actually not other people. It's yourself. The greatest enemy to your joy in the Christian life is the person in the mirror. It's not Jonah. It's not God. That's what Jonah thought. And I'll take a look at this. The the New Testament tells us that one of the greatest enemies to our joy is selfish pride. One of the reasons that we struggle with this is it's natural. In Ephesians 2, 3, uh, Paul kind of explains this and he says, what you need to see, he's talking to the church and he says, all of you, also lived among them, this is the world, at one time, and followed its desires and thoughts. 
he says that you, uh, all of us gratified the cravings of our flesh, which is to say that we all were led by our stomachs, by our eyes, instead of by faith. And he said it's natural for the human heart to be bent in on itself. And so what are some of the signs of a selfish heart? The first thing is it cares more about getting than receiving. It cares more about getting than receiving. Notice how juiced Jonah was about the plant because it benefited who? Him. How juiced was he about Nineveh? I eh, couldn't care less. The second thing is a selfish heart neglects the needs of others. Jonah cared nothing about Nineveh's true needs, even though God identifies them as people who are unsure of what the truth is. For Jonah, eh, it doesn't matter. In 1 John, the, the Apostle John warns the church saying this, it says, If any of you have material possessions and sees a brother or sister in need but has no pity, how can the love of God be in that person? Is it saying that every time we have a need, we're to cash out? No, but what it's saying is that if you can look around the church and never have pity for somebody, it would seem to suggest that underneath it, God is not present, but just you. And so a selfish heart not only cares about getting more than giving, it neglects the needs of others. Third is it's impatient. How patient was Jonah in this? He was patient with God, but he cared nothing about Nineveh. In in the uh, New Testament, Romans 15 tells us that we who are strong ought to bear with the failings of the weak and not please ourselves. So we've seen so far the signs is it's impatient. It cares more about getting than receiving. It neglects the needs of others, and it's a sign of the times. Uh, What's funny is the Apostle Paul told this about the church. He said in 2 Timothy 3, he said, Watch out, because people will be lovers of themselves. Lovers of money, boastful, proud, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy. And that's what we're dealing with. That's what Jonah had to deal with. Now, I say all that to say, how exactly does selfishness kill the joy? How does it rob us? I want to take you to a story. Open, If you will, go with me to Matthew chapter 19. Uh, I'll take you to a story of where Jesus uh, had to deal with this. In Matthew 19, and we'll be in verse... Oh, we'll be in verse 16. We come across a man that's known affectionately as the rich young ruler. Uh, the man is intelligent. Uh, he's wealthy. He is successful. And he really wants to draw near to God. He has the same goal that a lot of us have. And in verse 16, he says, Teacher, what good thing must I do to inherit eternal life? He's not just worried about heaven, but he says, I want to draw near. So check. He's already on to the right track. And what Jesus does is he talks with them. He says, okay, you know, you got to follow the law. You got to don't murder, don't steal, don't kill. He's like, hey, scout's honor. I've been doing that forever. And guess what? He was right. And then Jesus, in only the way he could, identifies the root at his heart. And he challenges them. And he says, you know, you're kind of doing these things. But you're doing these things to get something for yourself. Which seems to me that what's at the core is not me, but you. And so he says this. Okay, here's the thing you've got to do. And he says in verse 21, If you want to be perfect, go sell your possessions and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. In verse 22, it says this, The young man heard it and he went away sad. Because of his great wealth. It's not a parable against wealth. Wealth is just a tool. But it's a a challenge against what happens when we are at the center of our heart. And how God can't exist in that place. And so what happened for this man is God went this way. He went that way. And so we see already that what selfishness does is it alienates us from God. For Jonah, he was so self-interested that his world revolved around himself. And that's the challenge we must all overcome, is that our greatest enemy is, is, is us. It's always easier to blame somebody else. What will happen is if you don't rest in the gospel, at least my temptation is, well, it's, it's this person's fault. It's my boss's fault. It's uh, the cereal. It didn't give me the strength that day for me to be kind. It's that fault. 
But in Genesis chapter 3, what we see are the first three sins that mankind does. When mankind is uh, sins, the first thing they do is uh, they have are introduced to shame. They're fearful. The second thing they do is they run away from God. And then do you remember what the third thing is? God finally talks to Adam. He says, hey, like, you know, he's got throws the challenge flag and says, okay, let's go back. And what happened here? Uh, and he says, you know, the woman that you gave me, you know, she's the one who did it. Already in the beginning, there's a blame shifting. There's a, oh, oh, it's not me. Uh, it, it's her, Lord. It's an introduction. And so, brothers and sisters, we must always be guarded against that. Because uh, this is what we're going to struggle against. This is what we uh, have to fight against. And so the first challenge, the great enemy to joy is the person in the mirror, not other people. That's the first thing God wants you to see. The, the second thing God wants you to see is that simply, uh, you know, what we do is we need his help in identifying misplaced priorities. We'll take a look at that. We need God's help in identifying misplaced priorities. And, and Jonah needed God's help because Jonah had a selfishness and then he acted out of it, you see. And one of the things that happened, as, as the words of my father, he ended up getting himself cruising for a bruising. You ever heard that one? And God teaches him a lesson. And he, uh, in verse 5 through 9, he, he walks him through something. And uh, there's this kind of key phrase that's used. It said, Jonah went out down to the place east of the city. There he made himself a shelter. Uh, and then in verse 6, it says, The Lord God provided a leafy plant, and it made it grow up over Jonah to give shade. And then at verse 7, it says, But at next dawn, the next day, God provided a worm. And then in verse 8, it says, when the sun rose, guess what? Then God provided a scorching wind. You, see, you catch that? God provides the life. God provides the worm. God provides the judgment. What God is showing Jonah is he's reminding them that when selfishness is at the center, we live as if we are God. And God needed to remind Jonah that there is one person in charge of life death and judgment and it's the lord himself quite simply nothing passes to our life without first coming through god's hands jonah has to learn that and this is what we call the sovereignty of god some of you may know that word and guess what if you're on god's side it's a glorious thing because you know what it means it means that you know when you're wrongly terminated for your job and it comes out of nowhere and you're forced to walk through all of this deliberation on how to get your job and what's going to happen, it meant that it didn't strike God by chance, that he knew and he had you in his hand and that he would have you in your hand through that. It means that when uh, you're shocked at the diagnosis, God wasn't, and he already loved you then, and he's going to walk you through it. You know what it also means? God's sovereignty also means that all the prayers that you've been praying for your cousin who hasn't come to know the Lord you may think, ah, oh, man, that's, nothing is happening. But because God is in control, none of it is wasted. You see how glorious a truth like that can be? It simply says that nothing passes through our life by accident and that God wastes nothing that we do in faith. But you can only grasp it if you're living underneath God instead of over him. That's what Jonah had to realize. And so that's the first positive lesson that God teaches us is that he is sovereign. He's in control. But now we see, uh, for Jonah's case, the results of living in a misplaced way. I want to identify three things we just see in this book. The first is there's a spiritual blindness in Jonah. Take a look at what he says in verse 9 and 10. God says, is it right for you to be angry? And Jonah says, you know, or uh, uh, Jonah says, it is. And I'm so angry, I wish I were dead. Verse 10, you've been concerned about the plant, though you did not tend it, nor did you make it grow. It sprang up overnight and it died overnight. I mean, Jonah is so blind that he can't correctly judge what's important in his life. But what seems to be most important in his life is what first suits him. Do you catch that? And as a result, he's spiritually blind and away from God's heart. The second thing that misplaced priorities brought Jonah and us is a life of pain. I mean, Jonah has had a bad day. I mean, this is not the year you want to start in ministry. This isn't the way to start in a job. Uh, first, he, he tries to run. He can't run. 
uh, and then he causes grief to other people. You remember the sailors. Then he catches himself in whale barf, uh, and then he can't do that right. Uh, And then now all of a sudden he's dying on the vine, upset at God, and he can't even enjoy what God's been doing in his life. Think about all the pain that Jonah has caused himself and others by living in an upside-down way. And the third thing, that Jonah actually is spiritually dying, isn't he? You see, uh, scholars have noted that that little image of a vine, in a sense, is a little image of Jonah. Is that Jonah, when he sprung up and followed God, remember what happened? He was glorious. He blessed He was blessed to be a blessing, but then a little bit of selfishness entered in, just like a little worm, and it began to kill him at the core. And what we're seeing is like cut flowers. Jonah is dying as each day goes on. Brothers and sisters, we need God's help in identifying our priorities, don't we? The truth is, and I told you this, that God really does want us to have joy. I'll prove it to you. In Psalm 92, verse 12 through 15, uh, the Lord says this. I'll race you to it. All right, all right. Some of my sword drill people, where are you at? Um, 92, 12 through 15. I got it. I'll beat you to it. Uh, The righteous will flourish like a palm tree, and they will grow like a cedar of Lebanon. Planted in the house of the Lord, they will flourish in the courts of our God, which is to say that God desires that we uh, live and have the impact that he's designed us to have. That's really what he wants. In John chapter 15, Jesus takes this truth in the the Old Testament and pushes it forward and, and makes a promise. He says in these words, he says, listen, I'm the vine, you're the branches. If you'll remain in me, you will bear much fruit. Again, he says, I want you to flourish. I want you to live the life God wants. But it starts with being hooked into my priorities. And and the thing is, we need God's help in doing that. The question is, why don't we? Why do we struggle, you think? Why do we struggle like Jonah? One of the big reasons we struggle is because the world in which we live in is different than the world in which God's preparing for us. There are three forces against all of us to live the life that God wants. It's in 1 John 2. It says there's the lust of the flesh. There's the lust of the and the pride of life. That's right. And what do those mean? I'm not sure. I'm just kidding. Uh, Basically, so the lust of the flesh is a general view to say that the world is set against. But it says the lust of the eyes means this, is that Our world will train us to see only reality based upon what our senses show us. And that is we'll see only the visible instead of the invisible. One of the things we talked about in this book is Jonah's racism. He so treasured his ethnic identity as a Hebrew that he completely neglected who he was as a child of God. So he couldn't see his prophetic call. That's what happens when you only see what's before you. And you let the eyes dictate what's your reality. And you can't see that God had called Jonah and us to something bigger. You end up focusing on that. And that's what Jonah did. The second thing we see is the pride of life. Uh, one of the things we see in Jonah is a desire for the expansion of Israel as a nation. He's focused on what? Himself. And those are the things that work against him. And those are things that we have. We need God's help in that. One of the best things about our new uh, men's leadership, Mike Lewis and Brian Froud, is they're into this idea of calling LIP, Legacy Invite Participate. And I was talking with them, and I said, what does that mean? He says, basically, we want every man to make eternal investments into eternity. We want people to invite other souls to come to know Christ, and we want to participate in a mission that outlasts this world. I said, that's fantastic. And the truth is, we need God's help in identifying those same priorities. Or else we'll be subject to live against them. Now, you know this. Many of you have been sitting through messages like this. He said, it's another priority message. But why do you struggle to do it? Nothing I've shared here is quite novel. It's pretty old school. But why do we struggle? Why do you continue to struggle? Why don't you do it? 
one of the things that we, especially those of us who've been Christians for a long time, struggle to forget or struggle to remember is we can find ourselves getting into older brother mode. You see, Jonah is a type, I believe, of the New Testament, the older brother. If you go to Luke chapter 15, you'll see the parable of the glorious father in the lost sons. That's my take on it. You remember the younger brother, right? You know, he does the sex, drugs, and rock and roll, and he comes back, and the father forgives him. But do you remember what happens after? Now, in verse 28, it says that upon the younger brother being saved, the older brother became angry, and he refused to go in. See that? So his father went out and pleaded with him. He said, "Uh, look, all these years I've been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders. Yet you never gave me a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. You see the selfish heart there? Is he interested in the family being restored? He wants the goat, doesn't he? He wants the goat. As we keep going, he says, but when this son of yours, you see how how we other people I see how we talk about people that we don't care about. We kind of put them in categories. Not my brother that I love, but this son of yours. You know, and that's how I know that things are going well in my family. You know, if Elsie does good, it's hers. But if she does bad, it's mine. Uh, and so uh, it's just something I'm learning. Um, but when this son of yours who squandered your property with prostitutes come home, you kill the fattened calf. Verse 31, my son, the father said, you're always with me and everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. The older brother, what? Completely forgot. He became so self-centered on himself that his heart ended up way further than where his father was. He wanted what he wanted, even though everything God had was his. That's what can happen, brothers and sisters, when we let and live by the wrong priorities. And so we need God's help. Let us now look. uh, So what we've seen is God wants us to see three things. The first is that the greatest enemy to your joy is not other people but you. The second is that you and I need God's help in identifying misplaced priorities. And now we'll see what God's great priority is. God's great priority is people. That's God's great priority. That's ultimately what God has been trying to show Jonah this whole time from the beginning. That God is first and foremost concerned about people. And it says, look at verse 11. God says it like this. Should I not have concern for the great city of Nineveh in which there are more than 120,000 people who cannot tell their right hand from their left? In effect, he says, Jonah, man, what happened, son? How far did you get? I'm way over here, and you followed me, and you're way over there now. You've forgotten what my great priority is. That's God's great priority. God takes those same things, and in the New Testament, Jesus shows us his three priorities. You know, we only have about eight prayers recorded in the New Testament about Jesus. Of the eight, six of them are like one or two sentences. So for those who are like, man, I can't pray long, you got the Son of God on your side. So feel good about it. Uh, Because he only had a couple couple sentence prayers. Uh, But there is one that's the longest prayer. And what we see, it's the only prayer we ever see of just the Son and his Father. And he begins to pray for what he wants his people to prioritize their life around. Do you remember that? It's found in John 17. The first priority that Jesus wants his people to pray is that they would have a living, growing relationship with him. It says, now this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God in Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. He's not talking heaven here. But what he's saying is, this is what it means to really live, is to have a rooted relationship with the Father and the Son every single day. That's what I want for all them. Then he moves on and he begins to pray for others. And he says, I've revealed you to those, this is the church, whom you, or at the time the disciples, but by extension us, whom you've gave out of the world. I pray for them. 
I'm not praying for the world, but for those you've given me, for they are yours. I'm coming to you now, but I say these things while I'm still in the world so that they may have the full measure of my joy within them. You hear all the they language? There's this assumption, right, of being together. He keeps going, my prayer is not that you take them out of the world, but that you protect them. They are not of the world, even as I am not of it. Sanctify them, which is to wash, to cleanse them by the truth. Your word's truth. As you sent me into the world, I have sent them into the world. Second priority upon God's heart is that God's people grow up in love and maturity. That's what I want. That's what I'm praying for. And then finally, his third priority. My prayer is not for them alone. But I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message that all of them may be one. Father, just as you are in me and I in you, may they also be in us so that the world may believe that you sent me. I have given them the glory that you gave me, that they may be one as we are one, I in them and you in me, so that they may be brought to complete unity. Only then will the world know that you sent me and have loved them even as you've loved me. Three priorities in the heart of Christ. That his people have a relationship with him. That his body grow up together in love and maturity. And that his body branches out to others. That's what Jesus prayed that we would build our whole lives around. That's what Jonah was not building himself on. That's why Jonah had some pain in this whole situation. And so what we see is that God's great priorities are, are this. And that he wants us to live by these things. And so what we see this morning is that, number one, we will have the most joy in life when we walk according to his priorities. That's the truth is, uh, Jonah, think about how sad this is. Having worked with people, I know at least two things about every one of you. Number one is that each one of you have at least some semblance of fear of death, just like me, and that each one of you wants your life to count. Nobody here wants to live a life by which there's no, nothing counts, nothing of significance. And Jonah lived a great life on the eyes of the world, didn't he? I mean, he changed 120,000 people. How successful, how more successful can you be? Uh, he survived uh, the, uh, in a whale. He survived a hurricane. I mean, the guy, we would put him on one of these SB award, national years of the award with the, with the thing, in today. But let me ask you, does any of that stuff change him? Did any of that stuff grasp his heart? No. All that did is just make him more justified of his anger toward God and others. We and you will have the most joy when you live according to the way he Christ wants you to. There's something second let me show you how. Ephesians five fifteen to 16 says, Be very careful then how you live, not as unwise, but as wise, making the most of every opportunity because the days are evil. I'm going to show you how I've put this into perspective. Uh, this isn't the only way, but I want to give you a way. Uh, this is a verse that stuck out to me. Basically, what Paul is saying is we can't expect the world to do us any favors, can we? Uh, to say it like this, uh, instead... As we live as Christians, the wind is always at our face instead of our back. We're always moving uphill. If we want to follow God, the world and its values and its ways will always run counter to the priorities by which God has designed things. And so through help of a friend, what I've done is the way I've sought to live out this is uh, to purposely put the big rocks in. This is my schedule. Uh, and so uh, this is a way. It's not the way. But here's what I want you to see quickly is the three priorities. Number one is I put the big rocks in. Monday, fellowship time. This is just a way. It's not the way. But I want to give you a picture of this. The first priority is what? That I walk with Christ. And so already I put that in. Uh, secondly, I give my whole morning and the rest of the morning to the sermon. Because worship is also one of God's priorities. And then secondly, uh, Tuesday, I uh, work with the church. I do discipleship and we have an elder meeting and all this kind of stuff. Uh, and then uh, the third priority on Wednesday, I put in a block of evangelism. And, and the reason I show this all to you is to say that I have found that if you don't put the big rocks in first, 
you'll never have time to organize your life around this. Absolutely, you never will because the world is against you on it. And let me tell you this, that God will honor this. This little block here, I've been, I put this in for months because I've been wanting to grow in that third priority to branch out. And I had never gotten a chance because I've been, this, this stuff happens, you know. Two weeks ago, a man comes to me, comes to our church. I get a chance to meet him. And he says, hey, I want to learn about Jesus. I said, when are you available? Oh, Wednesday, maybe three to six. And that's where that, and that's where it was. And I said, praise God. I give you this to say. It's not, I'm not, it's not that I do this perfect every day, but I have found that if you don't put this in, the world will not do you any favors. And if you, by faith, try to live the life that God wants for you, he will honor it by bringing things among you that you can glorify him in. And so the first thing you'll see is that you will have the most joy when you live life this way. Here's the second thing I want you to see. I want you to keep receiving each person that comes here as someone that God loves and wants to transform. This is something that I think you guys are doing fantastic at. As I've talked with some of the people in our class, they're often saying, man, I feel a certain sense of love here. I feel a certain sense of joy here. Jonah, unfortunately, never received anybody but himself in his heart. Even though you had thousands of people who were lost, Jonah could care less. Brothers and sisters, you're doing this well. Keep it up. And so what we've seen, what I've told you, is that God wants you to enjoy life by following his priorities. I hope I've shown it in an homage to my uh, 11th grade teacher. That's what I told you today. God wants you to enjoy life by following his priorities. I want to now invite Pastor Kevin and the worship team up. Jonah ends, you know, kind of interesting. It's like the one book that you, there's not the, what the what's the old classic Disney saying? Uh, that, but they lived, what, happily ever after. Jonah didn't end like that. And brothers and sisters, uh, thankfully in Christ, Jonah's life doesn't become ours. The truth of the matter is that while Jonah was a prophet who cared nothing about people, Jesus Christ, out of his great love, Philippians 2 said that he emptied himself by taking on the form of a servant. That he came down from heaven in order to receive us. And by his faith we stand, and by that strength we live. I want to now go to a prayer time, and uh, I want to just, just eyes uh, closed and heads bowed. I'm just wondering, uh, I want to trust the Spirit. If there's somebody here who you just say, you know, I need a special prayer so that I can live by God's priorities. I, I need a special just prayer by which I can identify what's in my heart. Would you just raise your hand just for me so that I may pray for you right now? 